we've filed 16 patents uh, to date. We continue to make more filings on a regular basis, continue to prosecute those aggressively to protect uh, our intellectual property. And the team is really world-class, uh, have managed over 60 development programs with the FDA, filed more than 300 peer-reviewed papers, um, and uh, actually was what part of the team was responsible for developing esketamine and ultimately it was marketed by Johnson Johnson, which is really the first psychedelic compound that's been approved in the United States. Doug, Doug Drysdale joins, joins me now, CEO of Cybin Trades, trades on EO under, under the symbol CYBN, CYBN and, and in the United, United States, States under the symbol CYBN. Doug, welcome, Doug, welcome back. back. James, good to see you again. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah it's, it's always, always a pleasure, pleasure Doug. Doug. Uh, okay, okay, let's, let's have, have uh, let's, let's hear, hear what's, what's, uh, what's, what's been happening with Cybin lately. I saw a press release across the wire today. What's the news? Well, we continue to make tremendous progress. What you saw today was more milestones by the Adelia team. Adelia Therapeutics is a an acquisition we made back in December of, of last year, and and the team has really grown. I uh, from uh, five people a year ago to more than fifty five people today across four countries, managing fifty different partnerships. So we're really getting some tremendous momentum with all of our development programs. Okay, okay and, and so, so what, what is, is the sort of, of momentum, momentum being driven, driven by at this, this point? point? It's really moving programs through uh, preclinical work uh, with an expectation of data coming uh, around the end of this year for both our depression program, uh, CYB1, and our uh, alcohol use disorder program, TYB3. We're really looking to see if we can deliver that faster onset of action and shorter duration of action that we've been striving for. And that's uh, just around the corner now. Sure. Sure. And are you seeing uh, much in the way of, like, like I'm, I'm seeing a lot of new psychedelic companies coming to market every day. Is the uh, landscape getting crowded in your opinion? You know, it is crowded in the sense that there are a lot of startups, but I, I see that over the next 12 to 24 months, we might see quite a different picture uh, on, on two fronts, really. One in terms of capital and two in terms of IP. I mean, it's just a fact that not all of these startup companies will get the capital they need uh, to bring products through development. Uh, drug development is very expensive, the time consuming. And then from an IP point of view, uh, we're just at the early stages. The IP landscape is, is like uh, an iceberg field. You're just seeing the tips of those icebergs poking through above the waterline right now. And as patents start to issue in the next 12 months or so, uh, we'll see some conflicts, we'll see some failures, and we'll see some probably some mergers, some licensing, maybe some litigation. It's going to be an interesting, interesting time. But certainly both of those factors, I think, will drive some consolidation. Sure. Um, um, Simon's probably, probably one, one of the best capitalized of, of the psychedelic, psychedelic companies, companies out there. there. How, How have, have you been able, able to, to sort of preserve, preserve cash and move forward? forward? Well, we've, uh, we've been successful in five of the subscribed financing rounds so far. Uh, so that's uh, that's very encouraging. Uh, we continue to make strong progress. It's really about the development team uh, and our IP situation. We've filed 16 patents uh, to date. We continue to make more filings on a regular basis, continue to prosecute those aggressively to protect you know, our intellectual property. And the team is really world-class, uh, have managed over 60 development programs with the FDA, filed more than 300 peer-reviewed papers, um, and... Uh, Actually, was what part of the team was responsible for developing esketamine, uh, that ultimately was marketed by Johnson Johnson, which is really the first psychedelic compound that's been approved in the United States. Wow, that's, wow, that's amazing. amazing! And, and so, so has the pace of uh, decriminalization or, and, and sort of uh, permission for research continued to broaden across the developed world at this point? You know, that's an interesting question uh, because I see decriminalization as quite different from what we're doing. We're developing prescription psychedelic pharmaceutical products for mental health. Um, decriminalization, I think, is more about criminal justice reform. You know, in, in the United States, we have 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prisoners, uh, most of those from nonviolent uh, drug crime. So from that perspective, it's great to see decriminalization. But I also do think that it's a, a kind of leading indicator of sentiment towards 
these kinds of molecules. <clears throat> we even saw DEA come out recently and, and recommend an expansion in the quota that they will, they will, uh, they will approve uh, of psilocybin available for research over the, over the coming uh, 12 months. So there's building momentum yeah, for sure. 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 Do, you Do you see, see the, the progress, progress of, of uh, 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 national, national criminal de or decriminalization of cannabis in the United States as a positive for the psychedelic space? I think it shows us, again, a positive sentiment towards looking at these kinds of molecules and maybe rethinking our attitude towards them. Uh, instead of labeling them all as bad, I think people are more receptive and open to, to learning more about how they can help in, in mental illness and, and in other conditions. And so, uh, and I think the pandemic that we're in has led to that. I mean, on, on the one hand, this pandemic has created more mental health issues, uh, definitely more depression, substance abuse, and, and suicides. But it's also uh, created an openness uh, to talk about mental health and be aware of it. And that increased openness and that increasing, um, I think, hope uh, of, of looking at new ways of doing things is fueling, I think, the, the whole sector, and probably medical uh, cannabis as well. Sure. sure. Are, Are there, there have, have any, any major, major roadblocks developed, developed in, in any jurisdiction that might, might affect Ivan's progress at this point? point? No, we're not seeing any. You know, I mean, there are challenges to managing Schedule One drugs, of course. I mean, you have to work with partners and with uh, facilities and institutions that are licensed, uh, whether it's DEA in the United States or other regulators in, in Canada and Europe where we're working as well. Uh, so that requires a lot of paperwork, uh, it requires security and, and cameras and vaults and safes and all those things. But those are all conditions that uh, drug developers are used to working with, with controlled substances like uh, oxycodone, for, for example. So yes, there are some hurdles, uh, but really nothing that's insurmountable for us at this stage. Great. Right. So, so then, then what, what keeps, keeps you awake, awake at night? night? Is, Is there, there anything, anything that, that sort of, sort of sort makes, makes you sort of uneasy, sort of uneasy about, about the future for Simon? Simon? Well, not uneasy, but of course, uh, every CEO gets awake at night by something uh, or other. And uh, I think one of the larger challenges in front of us is just infrastructure. So when I look around North America and Europe for investigators or therapists or institutions that have psychedelics experience, those are fairly limited. And when you think about the multiple drug programs that we're looking to, to run uh, clinical studies with and other companies doing the same thing, there's clearly not enough infrastructure. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that we partnered with Greenbrook TMS recently. Uh, Greenbrook listed on the NASDAQ. They, uh, they run 149 uh, mental health centers across the United States in, in all 50 states. And that, they have access to tens of thousands of depressive patients uh, on an annual basis. So we think that this partnership can help bring us infrastructure, patients, expertise, and delivery of care to help supplement some of the existing infrastructure that's out there. So short answer is scaling is always a challenge uh, in, in any uh, new, new industry. And uh, in here, we're having to build some of the infrastructure ourselves through, through partnerships. Sure. At, At what, what point do you think that the health, the HMO system in the United States and health insurance in other more social-leaning countries, at what point do you see them actually stepping up to cover the costs of treatments using psychedelics? I think they're already very excited. Uh, we've had conversations with, with payers and with payer provider models in the, in the U.S., and they look at the potential to... Uh, remove someone's depressive symptoms or their addictive cravings for weeks or months at a time from one or two doses. That's really game-changing. Um, on the addiction side, giving someone a, a, a clean space where they, um, they can change behaviors and form new habits, where they're not taking substances for weeks or months at a time, uh, helps reduce comorbidities and helps reduce your health care costs. On the depression side, the same thing, lost productivity and comorbidities of depressed patients that are being managed by treatments that are not too effective today. So they're looking at this, so the payers are looking at this from a pharmacoeconomic perspective. We're running pharmacoeconomic studies to help support some of those uh, claims that we'll make as we go forward. Sure. Huh. Does, does, the, uh, does, does it make sense, sense in, in terms, terms of, of the scalability, scalability of the, the sort, sort of the personal, personal like, like I've heard, heard it, I've heard, heard it said that pretty, pretty much you have to have two uh, uh, registered qualified individuals in a room while administering a psychedelic to a patient. And, and I, I think, think about, about that in terms of how does that scale 
and make, make the cost still bearable to an individual who might be expected to pay a portion of the health care they, they receive. Yeah, I think scaling is a challenge. <clears throat> when we look at some of the classical psychedelic drugs, they're, they're quite long acting. MDMA may be 10 hours or so, LSD could be eight hours, psilocybin might be six hours. And when we speak to our clinical partners, they struggle with that concept too. They struggle to understand how they can uh, give up an entire treatment room for an entire day for just one patient. That That's not really their business model. So we need to come up with treatments that uh, can adapt uh, to, to their business model so that we can get adoption of these treatments. So at Cybin, we're taking a number of different approaches across our pipeline to develop treatments that are much faster in terms of onset, so not having to wait an hour or so for the drug to kick in, much shorter in terms of duration, maybe fitting within a typical therapy window, 45 minutes to two hours, something in that time slot, that then depression clinics and addiction clinics can uh, adapt to, or at least bring into their treatment paradigm. And I think if we can do that, uh, then you'll see broader adoption and those costs per patient come down quite significantly. You bet. All right, All right Doug, Doug, that's, that's a great, great update. update. We're going to leave it there for now. I appreciate your time again, again and, and I look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you very much, James. You bet. Bye, Bye for now. now. Let's take a quick capital structure uh, scorecard look at Cybin. <clears throat> They've raised $120 million to date, four active drug programs, uh, as Doug pointed out in yeah. the interview. 50 different, so this is, you know, cash and cash equivalents totaling 55 million still as of January 3rd, June 30th. So they don't need to raise a lot of money anytime. Yeah, so these are the ones you could, that, that are driving the price lower. These, ex, I bet these are being exercised as we speak. Right, All, a tat tat. Anything below two bucks is gonna get exercised and sold pretty quick. As of the last quarter, there's 148 million shares out. 28 million warrants, 21 million options. Hmm. That's 200 million. Hmm. Next channel, 200 million. 200 million is 200 million. Yeah. In terms of share price performance, it has been, uh, it's been a loser since uh, mid-July. It's just, the trend is downward. Um, and. But you see that steep drop there again? Yeah, like that really steep one, right? Right here. Whenever you get that, and it, 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 it carried on, carried on, and went so far, right down to, right down to here. Mm -hmm. And that move, see, backing and filling again. Backing and filling, backing and filling. Uh, I think though the downward trend from here looks like it's starting to widen out and we're basing out a bit. Yeah, That would be nice to see and then if you get an uptick. Yeah. But, but the fact that they're listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So that's, it's still got some downward pressure but, against it. But money coming in. But money coming in, I like Simon. I think it's one of the more promising companies out there. 